Hey everybody, we're back again with another episode of James Bond Revisited as we get closer and closer to the release of No Time to Die. Could it be that we're finally, finally, finally gonna see this long delayed James Bond epic, which of course everyone is saying will be Daniel Craig's last time playing 007. Whether or not that's actually true, we'll just have to wait and see. So, what are we going to do this week? We're going to list the top 10 James Bond films of all time, in our opinion, here at Joe Blow. First, a note. My editor, Nick Bosworth, really wanted me to include Moonraker of all films in this list. And I told him, Nick, Moonraker is a fun film, but it is definitely not one of the best James Bond films. Yes, it is! No, it isn't! Yes, it is! No, it isn't! But to Nick, Moonraker is indeed one of the best James Bond films, so I suppose I'll have to give it a very, very, very controversial honorable mention, but no, Moonraker is not even close to one of the best James Bond films. I'd say it's even one of the worst James Bond films. Oh shit! But it's still kind of fun. I mean, that's the thing about Roger Moore. He could make even the direst James Bond material work. And I mean, James Bond in space. If anybody could make it work, it's Roger Moore. So for Nick, let's throw in Moonraker. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. But I accept it. But now let's get to the real top 10, the 10 best James Bond movies of all time. So coming in at number 10, we've got For Your Eyes Only. So this was a departure for Roger Moore. In fact, at a point, it looked like Roger Moore wasn't even gonna return to the franchise after Moonraker, despite that film being a huge hit. I suppose he just wanted more money, but it looked for a while like Michael Billington, who was actually Major Anya Amasova's love interest in The Spy Who Loved Me, who gets killed in the opening teaser, was actually signed to play James Bond. And in fact, there were stills taken of him on location, so he came very close to becoming our new James Bond in For Your Eyes Only. Indeed, though, Roger Moore decided to return at the 11th hour, but the creative brain trust behind For Your Eyes Only had changed a little bit. I think that Albert R. Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson, who were producing at the time, realized they had gone more than a little overboard in Moonraker, so the decision was made to bring James Bond back down to Earth. Thus, For Your Eyes Only is a lot more grounded compared to other James Bond films of the era, with Roger Moore giving one of his grittiest portrayals as 007 in the lead. I always really liked For Your Eyes Only. I thought the stunts were amazing. I thought that a lot of the action is really good. And it probably contains my favorite ever Roger Moore performance as James Bond because he's just cool in this movie, you know? He's not necessarily jumping into bed with every woman he sees. He passes up BB, who's really young, Lynn Holly Johnson as a skater, offers to buy her some ice cream instead of jumping in the sack with her. I think that's what I love about Roger Moore in this film. It's his nice nicest portrayal of James Bond, I guess, but he's also tough as hell, such as when he kills the assassin that killed his buddy Ferrara by throwing the pin and then booting his car off a cliff. I mean, it's really cool. And this movie's also got a great sidekick, Topol. You got Carol Bouquet as Melina Havelock, who's kind of a badass James Bond heroine. The only problem with this movie is that Julian Gray is really boring as Christados, the villain. Not a very good villain, but a great James Bond movie with a great job by John Glenn behind the camera in his first ever James Bond film. I'm a little bit mixed on the score, however, by Bill Conti. Probably would be higher on the list if it wasn't for that really weird, schlocky, disco-y score. Although I love the theme song by Sheena Easton, one of the best. Farewell, Mr. Bond, but not goodbye. Thanks so much for watching James Bond Revisited. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now and click on the bell so you can be notified every time a new video goes up. Now back to the show. Coming in at number nine, one of my favorite James Bond movies of my childhood was The Living Daylights. In fact, when I was a kid, I did something bad and I was punished by having my VHS copy of The Living Daylights being taken away. Oh yes, it was traumatic to put it mildly. So this one was Timothy Dalton's debut as 007, and you can still see that he's trying to find his footing. I think Dalton's just a much more serious actor than Roger Moore is, maybe even more so than Sean Connery. He's playing 007 pretty straight-laced, but they're still throwing in some one-liners and some Roger Moore-esque stuff, and he seems a little bit uncomfortable, especially in a tuxedo. I always thought that Timothy Dalton looked more comfortable in casual clothes, which is very evident in his next James Bond film. He also holds a cigarette really weird, as if he's not really a smoker, but is just doing it because, you know, he has to be James Bond. James Bond smoked at the time. A lot of things about this movie are great. It's got an amazing score by John Barry. It's got a great theme song by Aha. 
and it's got a really good cast. Although again, oof, some really weak villains with Yaron Krabe as Koskoff, Joan Ombaker as Whitaker. I like the main bad guy, Nikros, who's kind of like the assassin that's going after James Bond because they have some really good fight scenes. And I think this is probably the best thing about The Living Daylights is that the action in this film is top notch. It's almost James Bond meets Rambo towards the end when he goes to Afghanistan to help the Mujahideen. Of course, this isn't necessarily a PC movie to watch nowadays, but it's a pretty good little Bond film. And again, it was one of my favorites when I was growing up. I'll report in an hour. Won't you join me? Better make that two. Coming in at number eight is another Timothy Dalton James Bond movie, License to Kill. Now, I've always said that Timothy Dalton probably had the strongest run as James Bond. He only did two James Bond movies, but they were both amazing. And License to Kill really feels like it's the first James Bond movie that was tailored for Timothy Dalton. Minimal time is spent in his tuxedo. Instead, James Bond is kind of wearing casual street clothes for a lot of the movie, some kind of unstructured blazers. He looks comfortable. He looks like this is the kind of role that he wants to be doing. There's something down earth about Timothy Dalton in this movie and I don't think that any other James Bond actor could have pulled off a James Bond role like he has in License to Kill where he has to be a lot more grounded. This movie also has an amazing villain, one of the best ever with Robert Davi Sanchez, a drug dealing sadist who nevertheless is somewhat sympathetic because he's so loyal to his henchmen and one of his henchmen is played by an impossibly young Benicio Del Toro. It's also got two of the best James Bond girls. You got Talisa Soto as Lupe but the best ever is Carrie Lowell as Pam Bouvier who's absolutely gorgeous especially with her short haircut and is a pretty badass Bond girl to boot. This one's got a very Joel Silvery kind of 80s score by Michael Kamen with a good theme song by Gladys Knight and it ends with a song If You Ask Me To by Patti LaBelle that would become a massive hit for Celine Dion a few years later. I really like License to Kill. It's probably the most violent James Bond film ever made but when I was a kid I watched it over and over again and, and it's one that I, I think really holds up well. In fact it probably plays better now than it did in 1989. It was also the first James Bond movie to rated PG-13. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Oh my God, it's Wayne Newton. Coming in at number seven, our first Daniel Craig movie on the list, Skyfall. Now I have to say that Craig's run as James Bond has definitely been hit or miss. It seems that the odd numbered Daniel Craig James Bond movies are really good and the even numbered ones just aren't. So Casino Royale is number one, was really good, but Quantum of Solace, number two, was not. Number three, however, Skyfall was excellent. This one's got a great villain with Javier Bardem, a much bigger role for Judi Dench's M, and some really good set pieces courtesy of director Sam Mendes. The photography by Roger Deakins I think is probably the best we've ever seen in a James Bond movie. I don't think any James Bond movie has ever looked quite as good as Skyfall does, and Daniel Craig really gives it his all in the performance. He's in his physical prime in this movie and it shows. It's got some really good action scenes and it holds up really well. Where the hell have you been? Enjoying death. 007 reporting for duty. Coming in at number six is probably the most critically respected Roger Moore James Bond movie of all time, The Spy Who Loved Me. Now, I do think it's a little bit inconsistent because the movie doesn't really pick up, in my opinion, until Triple X and Roger Moore, James Bond, of course, are paired up in the desert when they're on the run from Jaws. But there's so many classic moments in this movie. For one thing, it's got that opening ski jump by Rick Sylvester, which is just amazing when the Union Jack parachute opens up. It's got a great theme song, one of the best ever by Carly Simon. Nobody does it better. The disco-y score by Marvin Hamlish isn't great, but I do like his kind of take on the James Bond theme, Bond 77, which I think suits the movie really well. You got the Lotus Esprit, you got Q coming along to give a couple of one-liners and look annoyed at 007. You got Kurt Jurgens as Stromberg with the webbed hands, and of course you've got Jaws. I mean, you can't go wrong with Jaws. I also really love Barbara Bach as Anya Omasova. I think that she's a little bit stiff, but I think the character is really cool and makes a good foil for Roger Moore as Bond. Where's Peckish? Pyramids! Ah! What a helpful chap. Coming in at number five, one of the Sean Connery classics, From Russia With Love. Now, this is a little bit slow, I've always thought, but it's such a well-crafted James Bond film. You got Terrence Young directing, you got an amazing score by John Barry, his first full score for the series, and you have one of the best James Bond villains ever, Robert Shaw as Red Grant. The story is pretty compelling. Sean Connery is lured to Istanbul to recover the Lector spy decoding machine, and of course he's lured there by a Russian 
cipher clerk, played by the gorgeous Daniela Bianchi, who they say has fallen in love with him based on a picture. Of course, it's all a plot by Spectre, Kronstein, and Rosa Klebb, as well as a shadowy version of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, whose face we never see, just his kitty. And it all ends in that amazing fight scene on the Orient Express, and then a later fight scene in a Venice hotel room where James Bond has to take on Rosa Klebb's pointy shoe with the shoe knife. I always thought it was really cool. It's a good movie. It has some good action. And I think in some ways, the editing by Peter Hunt is largely responsible for the current editing that we see in action movies nowadays. In some ways, you could even say that From Russia With Love was the first modern action film. You're one of the most beautiful girls I've ever seen. Thank you. But I think my mouth is too big. No, it's the right size. Number four is Pierce Brosnan's first and best performance as James Bond, Goldeneye. Now, the thing about Pierce Brosnan is he was an amazing James Bond who just never got really good material. Goldeneye, however, was his first and his most promising take on the part. You had Martin Campbell directing, who always knew exactly how to make a James Bond movie. You had Isabella Skrupko, and you had Famke Janssen plus Sean Bean as one of the best James Bond villains ever, 006, who's very much James Bond's physical equal, and they have that amazing fight scene at the end of the movie. It's also got a really cool but unusual score by Eric Serra, and that great theme song by Tina Turner and Bono. This is a really good Bond film. The pacing is off a little bit at times, but I think in terms of Pierce Brosnan Bond movies, you really can't get much better than this. And I wish that they had really kind of kept up the quality level through all these movies, but I think they just threw more and more money into them, more and more action, and made them less complex. You see, Goldeneye had a really good script. The other Bond movies that he did probably had bigger budgets, but the scripts just weren't as good. For England, James? No. Coming in at number three, Sean Connery in Goldfinger. Now, the James Bond series as it exists now simply would not be what it is without Goldfinger. I mean, this movie kind of established the formula. You have the larger than life villain, or Goldfinger, played by Gert Frobe. You got Pussy Galore. No, it's a character name, Pussy Galore, played by Honor Blackman. You had that golden girl, Shirley Eaton. I mean, that's great. Plus, you had the Aston Martin DB5, complete with Desmond Llewellyn as Q's first Q branch nifty gadget scene. I mean, it's the best in that car chase where he's just ejecting people, <laughs> shooting off machine guns. I mean, it is a great James Bond movie. I have an absolute blast every time I watch this movie, and the theme song is so good by Shirley Bassey. He loves gold! <laughs> it's such a good film. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Coming in at number two is going to be a surprise to some people, Casino Royale. Daniel Craig's first turn as James Bond was his best. I don't think it's a coincidence that Martin Campbell is the director of two of the James Bond films in the top five because he really knows how to do a movie like this and especially knows how to introduce a James Bond to the audience. I mean, if they bring in somebody new in the next one, you really got to get Martin Campbell back to direct because he just nails it every time, knocks it out of the park. And there's so many good things about Casino Royale because the book isn't very cinematic. It all ends in a poker game with a sad ending, but Martin Campbell just pepper in tons of amazing action scenes, including that opening parkour sequence. You know, I think that once we all saw Daniel Craig doing parkour, we knew that a new action icon had been born. And man, his James Bond was going to be a lot different and a lot more physically capable than the ones that we'd seen come before. Daniel Craig is amazing. He has probably his best performance ever as James Bond. It's got a great score by David Arnold. Only thing about it was I always thought that the Chris Cornell theme song, You Know My Name, didn't sound really Bond-like, although I do like the song a lot. And, you know, of course, I miss Chris Cornell, as does everybody. But Casino Royale, in my mind, is pretty much a flawless James Bond film with flawless villains, including Mads Mikkelsen as Le Chiffre, and perhaps the most flawless James Bond girl of all, Eva Green as the gorgeous but tragic Vesper Lind. The name's Bond. James Bond. And number one, a controversial pick to be sure, but one I gotta go with, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yes, George Lazenby may have been the worst James Bond, but he was in the best James Bond movie. And I honestly think that George Lazenby, had he been given a chance to grow into the part, would have probably emerged as one of our best James Bonds ever. He looks great. He fights really well. The action scenes in this movie are awesome. It's got an amazing Bond girl with the late Diana Rigg as Tracy. Plus, James Bond gets married in this movie. It's epic length, running just a hair under two and a half hours at two hours and 20 minutes. It's got that beautiful location 
location photography, all the snow in Switzerland and Pitt's Gloria. Plus it's got one of the best scores ever by John Barry. It has that great song by Louis Armstrong, We Have All the Time in the World. It's got kind of a romantic vibe. All the girls are gorgeous. I mean, this movie has all the elements of James Bond that you could ever possibly want, but it's also probably the James Bond film that the least people have seen because of probably Lazenby. Nobody really thinks of him as James Bond, but damn, they made a great James Bond movie and Peter Hunt as the director absolutely nailed it and I wish he had come back to do some more James Bond films because he really really knocked it out of the park with this one. So Honor and Imagine Secret Service is my favorite James Bond movie of all time but I know that a lot of you are probably going to disagree with me so make sure to let me know in the talkbacks and of course we'll have to revisit this down the line once No Time to Die comes out. My fingers are crossed that it's going to be worthy of this top 10 list and that I'm going to have to go back in and revise it. But until it comes out, we'll just have to wait and see. Join us next time on James Bond Revisited. And if you like this kind of stuff, make sure to click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.